our merciful and loving Father. Yes, sir. In spite of your love, we know that we fail you. But Father, here we are before your holy presence, thanking you again for your blessings and your mercy and asking for forgiveness for any sins that we've done that we might be worthy to continue on fulfilling our duties and serving the most holy name. Father, you know our hearts and our minds. You know that we truly desire to serve you. But sometimes, our Father, because of our human weaknesses, we fail you. But we ask you, Father, to please Continue to strengthen us. Yes. As we listen to your holy words this evening, we pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds of understanding that we may be able to understand your truth. Yes. And we'll be able to have the faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had in fulfilling their duties before the most holy sign. Amen. Knowing our Father that we should not serve any man or any other God except you. And we ask your Father to grant us that faith so that we may be able to overcome the many obstacles that we encounter in this life and we'll be able to go on fulfilling our duties and serving the most holy name. Visit the homes of all of your children. As we listen to your holy words, we ask your Father to please let us be able to understand your truth. So that, Father, we may be able to live by your words and continue on serving you until the end of our lives. Amen. We pray that you visit those of our brethren that are being oppressed, persecuted, those that are in hiding, those that are falsely accused and in jail. Visit them, our Father, so that they will feel your presence and be strengthened to go on fulfilling their obligations and serving the most holy name. We pray, Father, that you would visit those that might have caused the persecutions or the oppressions. Visit them as well. Touch their hearts so that they will be able to understand where they've gone wrong and will be able to ask for repentance. And one day be in your will, we will all be together fulfilling our obligations and serving the most holy name. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we call on you, asking you that you would please be in our midst and take our prayers to the Father, asking the Father to hear our prayers and forgive our sins so that we can continue to serve you and our Father until the end of our lives. Mm -hmm. Our Father in heaven, as we return to you in prayer, be with your servants that will teach your words, guide him with your Holy Spirit so that he may be able to teach your word with clarity so that everyone that is listening will be able to be inspired to continue on serving and glorifying the most holy name. We truly believe, Father, that you will be with us throughout our Bible study, and that you've heard the prayers of your children, and that you will grant your blessings, because we ask everything in the name of thy son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Beloved brothers and sisters, the lesson that we are going to study is the differences and characteristics of the Father, Christ, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit. There are those who, because of uh, having some kind of characteristic, they conclude that these three are one God. And the so-called it the Trinity, when we know that Trinity was just invented by the early church fathers, Tertullian, and also the teachings that Christ is God and the Holy Spirit is God was also invented in the fourth century by the Catholic Church. So let us go ahead and study first about what the Father would want us to do. 
so that we will be able to start this lesson this very moment. Let us start Matthew 17, 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. What did God the Father say concerning about the Lord Jesus Christ? This is my beloved Son. And what, is, well, what else did he say? In whom I am well pleased, hear him. What does the Son have to say about the Father who spoke these words? In John 17, 1 and 3, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The one who spoke a while ago, the Father in heaven, saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. What does the son have to say to the father? Well, he looked up to heaven and said, father. So he's speaking to the father. Who is speaking to the father? Our Lord Jesus Christ. What did he say to the father? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. And how about Jesus? And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, who is greater? The sender? Or the one that is sent. Of course, the one that sends. And who is the one that sent? The Son. The Father. Did not the Bible say in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world and sent his begotten Son. See? So God the Father was the one who sent his Son. That alone shows that the Father and the Son, they're totally two different beings. Another thing is, if our Lord Jesus Christ is sent by the one true God, the Father, and knowing that the Father is the only true God means you have eternal life, how about the Holy Spirit? Who sends the Holy Spirit according to the Lord Jesus Christ? John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Who sends the Holy Spirit? The Father, according to the Lord Jesus Christ. And according to the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus himself, the Son, was sent by the Father. So both the Holy Spirit and our Lord Jesus Christ was sent. Were sent. So... Who else sends the Holy Spirit? Let's read John 15, 26. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. What did our Lord Jesus Christ say about the helper, the Holy Spirit? He spoke that I shall send to you. So the Father sends the Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus Christ also sends the Holy Spirit, and the Father sends the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we were to conclude that uh, these three are one true God, what do you think is going to happen, beloved brethren? How many spirits does God send throughout the world or throughout the earth? Revelation 5, 6. And I look, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. How many spirits has God sent all throughout the earth? Seven. Could you imagine if you allow that uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and uh, these are one trinity or one triune God, 
what about those others that the Bible makes mention which seven spirits of God sent out into all the world? It should not be called Trinity. It should be called ninety, right? Because how about the other? Uh, how about the other six? How come they're not included, right? So uh, it is a complicated uh, teaching to accept the teaching of Trinity because it's not found in the Bible. Look at your Bible. Read it from Genesis one one all the way to the Book of Revelation. You cannot find the word Trinity or Triune God. Why so, beloved brethren, if there are those who are saying that God is composed of three persons, what does the Bible have to make mention about that? Galatians 3, 20, Amplified Bible. Now, a go-between intermediary has to do with a and implies more than one party. There can be no mediator with just one person. Yet God is only one person. And he was the sole party in giving that promise to Abraham. But the law was a contract between two, God and Israel. Its validity was dependent on both. What should we notice about this passage? Well, the Bible makes mention that now to go between intermediary has to do with and implies more than one party. There can be no mediator with just one person. But what is it that the Bible is mentioning? Yet God is only one person. Are we saying he's like a person, like a human being like us? No. The teaching that other are saying that three person in one God does not hold water because God is only one. So when David said in 8610, you alone are God. And when God says in the book of Isaiah, I know no other God beside me, there is none before me or after me, Isaiah 4310. So we can see that it is clear here, God cannot be three persons in one God, only one, because God is only one God, according to Christ himself, that they may know you, the only true God. He was speaking to the Father. So if we read another rendition of the passage of the Bible, let's read it in the New King James Version of the Bible. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one, see? So God is not the mediator here because who is supposed to be the mediator? And that's why we can conclude that mediator cannot be the one true God. First Timothy 2, 5 is stated, for there is one God. See that one person that the Bible is mentioning is speaking of one God, not three person in one God. For there is one God, why only one God? And one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So the one that really could do the duty as a mediator is not God, it's Christ, the one mediator between God and man. And what is the nature of that mediator? The man Christ Jesus. So if it's so true, that there's only one mediator between God and man, it is also so true that there's only one God, and that God is not composed of three persons. He's only one, brothers and sisters. But how about Christ, the man, Christ Jesus? From whom did the Apostle Paul get that teaching? The man, Christ Jesus, John 8, 40 to 42. But now you seek to kill me, a man, who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but 
he sends me. So it is so clear here. From whom did the apostle Paul get that our Lord Jesus Christ is a man? From our Lord Jesus Christ himself. What did our Lord Jesus Christ say about himself? I am a man telling you the truth. So for those who are saying that he's not a man, they're telling a lie. And the father of liars, if you continue reading 844 of the same verse, is the devil. And of course, we don't want to be the children of the devil because those who listen to the words of God, they are of God. But if they don't listen to the words of God, then they are of the enemy of God. Who's that? The devil. John 847. And so what does John 840 have to say when Christ says, I'm a man telling you the truth, which I heard from God. So from whom did you hear that he's God, Jesus? Well, for sure you did not hear from Christ himself. And for sure you did not hear from God, who alone is the one true God. Who's that? Well, even those who are accusing our Lord Jesus Christ, he's, they say we have one father, God. So what did our Lord Jesus Christ conclude? Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. Why? For I proceeded forth and came from God. So who did Christ come from? From God. Who's that? The father. What did he have to say about himself? Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Remember, the one who sent the Lord Jesus Christ is the father, and the one that is sent is the son. So how could they be one in saying that they are one true God? When Jesus already replied to us, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. So he's speaking, came from God. Do you know that God that he's saying? If you really, we quote the verse in 2017 of John, as Jesus said, do not touch me. For I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Do you remember when our Lord Jesus Christ was about to die? What did he say in Mark 15, 34? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So even our Lord Jesus Christ, we could see that he was crying out to a God in the time that he is in despair or about to die. But that God that he was calling to, is he also a man? Let's read 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? So how about the one that our Lord Jesus Christ was calling to? Said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is God man? God is not a man. How about Christ? He said in John 8, 40, I am a man telling the truth, which I heard from God. So we could see here what differentiates our God from the Lord Jesus Christ and from the Holy Spirit. Then what is man? Why is it that our Lord Jesus Christ was able to say, I am a man telling you the truth, Matthew 24, 38 to 39. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubt arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ could be seen. He said, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. How about God? God is spirit, according to John 4, 24. What does that mean? In 1 Timothy 1.17, God is invisible. So you cannot see him and he does not die. How about our Lord Jesus Christ? He said, handle me and see. So you could, they could see our Lord Jesus Christ. So our Lord Jesus Christ, did he die? And Others are saying, why was it possible that he was able to do miracles and wonders and signs? Acts 2, 22 to 23. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man 
attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. So, who was put to death? Our Lord Jesus Christ. But why was he able to do miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him? If you read this in the King James Version, a man approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs. So who approves that Jesus is a man doing miracles? God himself. Who approved that Jesus is God, the consul of Nicaea, right? And they approve that he is God in the fourth century. Who are you going to take side with? Take side with God who approves that Jesus is a man. But Jesus died. He was nailed on the cross. Yes, that was the purpose why he was sent so that you and me, sinners like us, will be given the chance to be cleansed and be forgiven for our sins. He was crucified and put to death by lawless hands. But we know, brothers and sisters, who raised him from the dead. We just continue reading that verse, beloved brethren, to 24. We know that God the Father was the one who raised Jesus from the dead. You see? So we could see the one that raised, the one that died, is different from the one that was resurrected from the grave. So if our Lord Jesus Christ was not raised by our God and was not helped by God by doing miracles and wonders and signs, what does Christ have to say about himself? John 5.30, I can of myself do nothing As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Who's that Father? That's God. So the reason why he is able to do what he is able to do, because he's only doing what the Father wants him to do, who sent him. How about if he was to do it all by himself? I can of myself do nothing. How about the one true God? Is he in the same situation? Genesis 35, 11. Also God said to him, I am God almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you and kings shall come from your body. So what is this that we should notice about what God has to say about himself? He said, I am God Almighty. With God, nothing is impossible. But we must understand with our Lord Jesus Christ, if he is all by himself, he cannot resurrect himself from the grave because he needed the help of God, who is Almighty, to resurrect him from the grave after three days. But why is it that he has all these titles and power that he has now? Kings of kings, Lord, um, and he has so many other uh, things that were given to him, attributes were given to him. Does that not make him God? First Corinthians 15, 27 to 28. For the scripture says, God put all things under his feet. It is clear, of course, that the words all things do not include God himself, who puts all things under Christ. But when all things have been placed under Christ's rule, then he himself, the Son, will place himself under God, who placed all things under him, and God will rule completely over all. So what is this that we should notice about our Lord Jesus Christ? All things were placed under his feet. Who placed all things under his feet? God. But when you say all things have been placed under his feet, who is not included there? God is not included there in the word all things. The Bible says, do not include God himself who put all things under Christ. Why? Because God 
the Father is Almighty. So what is it that our Lord Jesus Christ will do when due time, when time will come? But when all things have been placed under Christ's rule, then he himself, the Son, will place himself under God, who placed all things under him, and God will rule completely over all. You can see, brothers and sisters, they cannot be equal with one another. How sure are we that they are not equal? And let's read in First Corinthians, I mean First Corinthians three twenty three. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. So when we belong to Christ, does that make us Christ? When our Lord Jesus Christ belongs to God, does that make him God? No. If that's the case, we will be there will be so many gods. Because once we belong to Christ, and then Christ belongs to God, we also belong to God already. Because we belong to Christ. So brothers and sisters, it is a complicated teaching to say that Jesus is the one true God and the Father uh, is composed of three persons. Merely they say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So how do we know that they are not equal? There are things that they may be equal in, but not in the sense of being or being God. Let's read in John 14, 28. But I want you to know that the head of every, I mean, uh, First Corinthians 11, 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. So why are they not equal? Because the head of God, of Christ is God. It's like if the man is the head of the woman and Christ is the head of the man, Christ is, cannot be the head of God. God is the head of Christ. So we could see brothers and sisters, they're not equal. The proof of it, who mentions that they're not equal? John 14, 28. Let's read you have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the father for my father is greater than I. When you say greater than I, you cannot be equal in that matter. But where could we say that they might be or may uh, fall in the category of uh, being equal? If it's not, if it's not being equal in beings or being God, because they are totally different from one another. Uh, let's read here in John 10, 36. Here in, uh, I mean, first Peter 1, 15 to 16. First, let's read. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. What should we notice about God? He's holy. He said, I am holy. How about the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's read in John 10, 36. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world? You are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. See, he's saying the Son of God. He's not saying he's God the Son. No, the Son of God is different. From the Father. The Father is the one that made him holy. So why is Christ holy? Because we know in First Peter 2, 21 to 22, he never sinned. Because the Father sanctified him. So where could they be equal? In holiness. But not in power. And not being in one uh, as one true God. Because there's only one God according to Jesus. How about Jesus now? Where is he at this very moment? In Colossians 3, 1, he seated on the right hand of God. And what is the nature of Christ there seated on the right hand of God? If you read Psalms 80, 17, there is a man sitting on the right hand of God. Who is that? Our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the reason why if you read 1 Corinthians 15, 47, the first man is of the earth, Adam. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Who's that Lord? That's our Lord Jesus Christ, seated on the right hand of God. That's why if you read Psalms 110 and 1 or 11, it says there that the Lord said to my Lord, 
sit at my right hand. So there's this one Lord, which, which Lord is that? In Psalms 91 and 2, the one God from everlasting to everlasting, that's the Lord God that has his Lordship is never made. Acts 2.36, Christ's Lordship was made by the Father. So the reason why Christ is Lord, because he was made Lord. But the meaning of Lord, Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? It only means that we have to obey and follow what they have to say. And so, if the Lord God, the Father, the Almighty God, told the Lord Jesus Christ, who was made Lord, to sit on his right hand, that Lord on the right hand of God is a man, according to to Psalms 80, 17. How about the Holy Spirit? What does the Bible have to make mention of that? Psalms 51, 10 through 11. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So the Holy Spirit, as we mentioned there, is holy. God is holy who called us, our Lord Jesus Christ is holy because God the Father was one that sanctified, sanctified him and sent him into the world. Yes, in holiness, we could say that these three, they are holy. God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and our Lord Jesus Christ. But to conclude that they're one true God, three persons in one God, it's wrong because the Bible already indicates to us that but the one God is only one, not three person, only one, beloved brethren. And another thing that we should also consider, the mediator between the father and the, and the man, man to the father or the God, one true God, is our Lord Jesus Christ. And so how does the Bible show an illustration that these the Father, the Holy Spirit, and our Lord Jesus Christ totally are different from one another. Acts 10, 38. How God, or speaking about God here, anointed Jesus. So there's God. He anointed Jesus, the son of our Lord God, Jesus of Nazareth. What did he anoint with? What did he anoint Jesus with? with the Holy Spirit and with power. So the one that anointed Jesus was God. And the one that was anointed was Jesus. And what was anointed to Jesus by God the Father is the Holy Spirit. And why was he able to do all these miracles and wonders and signs? Because the Bible says, who went about doing good and healing all were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. So if we are being oppressed, brothers and sisters, and we know what happened to the church in this last days, there have been those who have been oppressed. We ought, we should ought to approach God the Father, who is almighty. We should also approach our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the throne of grace, as written in Hebrew 4, 14 and 16. And let us ask the Father in heaven not to take away the Holy Spirit from us and to create in us a clean heart. Brothers and sisters, we hope that this lesson is clear to show to us that they may have similar similarities, but they cannot be the one true God. There is only one God that the Bible teaches us. That's the Father taught by the Lord Jesus Christ. And knowing the Father as the only true God, according to Jesus, means eternal life. Are you interested with your eternal life? Then hold on to the teachings that our Lord Jesus Christ taught to us that will give us eternal life. This is our lesson. Uh, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for helping us to clearly understand the great difference between you and your son and the Holy Spirit that is sent to us in times of our needs. 
Thank you so much, dear Lord Jesus, for always being the throne of grace. We approach you and give and convey to you all the things that we experience in this life. Please send forth the Holy Spirit that comes from our Father and also our Father in heaven. May you send the power of your Holy Spirit into the lives of your people so that we'll be edified and strengthened and we'll be able to overcome all things that may come in our lives. Father in heaven, we return to you.